In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we continue in our service this morning, if you don't know me, my name is Peter. I have the privilege of serving as one of your pastors here at Center Point. And we are so glad you're here worshiping with us this morning. We want to keep you in the loop on some things we have going on. There's, and when you came in, you should have received a bulletin. There's a lot more things in there to keep you in the know on some announcements than what I have time for in our service. But I just want to highlight a couple of things that are coming up that I want you to be aware of. If you are a teen or you have a teenager in your life who would be interested in our youth mission trip, please see Crystal today after service so she can get you that info. We're trying to get the, the list of who's interested in going and get that finalized so we can start the fundraising process and the preparation. And Crystal's put a ton of time and energy into that and we're really excited for that. But if you are interested in going, if you're a teen, Or if you have a teen in your life you'd be interested in seeing go, talk to Crystal so we can get all that info to you so she can get that set up and we can start that process together. It's going to be a great time. Um, We're really excited about what God's done in the past in our mission trips and we're excited for this one. Also tonight at 6.30 at the house just across the street, 6.30 p.m. at the Parsonage, is our young adult small group. We met last Sunday and the group voted to continue meeting on Sunday nights more often than once a month. So we're going to meet again tonight and not next Sunday because of the next announcement that I have. Next Sunday, April 21st, I'm being ordained as an elder in the Church of the Nazarene. And I, do, I always forget that, that you guys get excited for stuff like that. I just try to move on. Thank you. I don't say that to puff myself up. I say that because you're invited if you'd like to go. Our, our whole church is invited. It is not here. It'll be at Flint Central Church of the Nazarene up in Flint, Michigan at 6 p.m. It is not just my ordination service. There's actually, I believe, 12 or 16, over 10 first-time licensees becoming first-time licensed pastors, and there are six of us being ordained as elders. If you want to know more about kind of that progression, if you've ever felt in a service like this, you felt God nudging you toward ministry or toward maybe you're feeling a call on your life toward being a pastor, I'd love to talk to you about that process. But that last piece of the process is next Sunday for me. You are invited if you want to come. It will be streamed as well, I believe, so if you don't want to drive all the way up to Flint, I understand that uh, that might, it'll get out kind of late, so you might not want to go, but you're welcome to be a part of that. You're my church family, which makes you my family, and I'd love for you to be there. So young adults tonight, not next Sunday because of that. And please check out the bulletin and keep up with our Facebook page for other announcements. We don't have time to share all of them, but we'd love for you to stay plugged into our life together as a church. Well, this is the point in our service where we pray a blessing over our families, and that means not just adults praying for our young people, that means young people praying for their parents and siblings and us praying together as a church family. So I want to invite all of us into that space of prayer together as we pray for our families. Would you pray with me this morning, church? Heavenly Father, we bring to you today our relationships, all of them, the ones that are easy, the ones that are hard, the ones with our blood family, the ones with our extended family, the ones with our friends, Lord. We know that these relationships are a gift, and they're not always perfect, but they're a gift from you, and we want to honor one another, and we want to ask your Holy Spirit to bless these relationships, to bless all the people that we are in relationships with, our parents, our spouses, our kids, our siblings, our grandparents, our cousins, and for those of us who our main families, this church family, Lord, bless our church family. Help us to feel your love and to feel connected each Sunday and in our life together. Lord, we pray you'd be especially present with our teens and our kids and their leaders today as they worship you together. Pour your spirit out on them in a fresh way. We know your Holy Spirit's already with them, but we ask you be with them in a special way today. And be with us as we continue to worship you together by studying your word. Pour your spirit out in your church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Kids, teens, you can head to your spaces. Everyone else, I want to invite you to turn to 1 John chapter 4. This is very near to the end of your Bible. That's maybe just a few books from the back. 
We're also going to be at the exact opposite end of your Bible in Genesis 3, but we're going to have that one up on the screen so you don't have to turn back and forth. But if you're someone who likes to know where we're going, there you go. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, or if you don't have a Bible, we have some on the table in the back there. You're welcome to borrow it for the service, or if you don't own a Bible, you're welcome to just take it with you. That is our gift to you. We believe strongly that the Scripture belongs to all believers. It's a gift to all of us. So not just the preacher. So this is one way we do that is by reading together. First John chapter four, we're gonna be reading verses 13 through 18. And we're gonna be coming back to this passage next week. So if you want something to read this week, it's five chapters in this book, maybe just Monday through Friday, read through first John, you'll be ready for where we go next week. Either way, this is our text for today. Hear the word of the Lord this morning, church. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. God has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, would you speak to us through this word? Guide my words to reflect the truth of this scripture. Guide all of our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit to know Jesus Christ more and more. Be with us in this time together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, church, we are in a series together that we started last Sunday called Out of the Grave. Now, you may be thinking, if you weren't here last Sunday, or if there was something that got lost in translation, out of the grave, that sounds a lot like an Easter sermon, something we should preach about on Resurrection Sunday. Well, yeah, you'd be absolutely right. But here is the beautiful thing about Easter. It's not just one Sunday that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Actually, the resurrection of Jesus is celebrated like a little Easter every single Sunday, and especially in this season, which is known as Eastertide, the season of resurrection. From Easter Sunday to Pentecost Sunday, which is on May 19th. I keep saying the date because we're gonna have a party that day. It's also gonna be our grad Sunday, but we're gonna have a Pentecost party. It's the birthday of the church. That whole season, that 50 days, is a season of resurrection hope, a season of hope in the possibility of transformed lives. If you're doing math, you may remember we spent 40 days in Lent in this season of grieving and sorrow and preparing our hearts for resurrection. But guess what? Resurrection is about 10 days longer because our hope is bigger than our pain and our grief. So this series, Out of the Grave, is about that idea that we have parts of our lives that need the effect and the transformation and the resurrection and the hope of Christ's resurrection to take effect now. Yes, we all need the hope that one day we'll be in heaven with the Lord, that one day in the new creation we'll be resurrected, but if we're honest, our lives are difficult, and there's hurts and pains right now, and we need resurrection power, and we need good news, and we need hope today. I think of the words of that hymn we sang, strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. That's resurrection power. We need strength for this day just as much as we need hope for our eternity one day. So we are in a month or so of talking about that. What does it look like to experience resurrection? Not just to believe in it and to wait for the eventual resurrection one day. What does it look like for our lives to actually be transformed? For the parts of our heart and our life that feel like death, to start to look like resurrection. What would that mean for us? Now this is the main way as Christians we talk about the Christian life. 
So we can't talk about all this in one series. What we're going to focus on are these internal feelings of death that we go through. The scripture has a lot to say about God providing for us. God bringing an answer to financial death or medical death or pain or suffering. God certainly wants to change our situation and our circumstances, and oftentimes God does. But if we're honest, there are parts of our lives that the circumstances may change, they may not, but the feeling of death and pain in our heart lingers and is difficult to have enough hope to believe that could change. So we are trying as a church to put on hope in a fresh way in this season. And today we are talking about two specific graves that we want to come out of, and I believe they're tied together. Today we're talking about fear and shame. Those may seem like they're very disconnected, but I think as we go through this morning, you'll see how this passage about the love of God and the grave of fear and the grave of shame are connected. Because if we're going to talk about hope, we need to know what might get in the way of that hope, don't we? What are the things that make it hard to hope? I think maybe more than anything else, fear makes it hard for us to have hope. If we're going to walk out of this grave in our life, if we're going to live the words of the scripture, we need resurrection power and we need hope. Verse 18 in the chapter we just read reads, There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Seems kind of weird to attach fear to punishment for those of us that are adults. It's tax season, so if you're like me and you're not very good at doing taxes, maybe there's some areas of your life where you're afraid of punishment. I really don't want to accidentally commit tax fraud. And as a pastor, our taxes are weird. So I'm a little afraid of messing something up, maybe getting in trouble. That wouldn't be good. But in general, as an adult, how much am I afraid of punishment? Maybe my boss might get on me. That would be your church board in this case. Maybe someone in my family might get mad, but they don't really have the authority to punish me. Once we kind of grow up, punishment isn't really the thing we're most afraid of. So what is the writer of 1 John talking about? We're talking about the love of God. So if we are experiencing fear in our relationship with God, that means we're not convinced that God loves us. We're not convinced that he loves us enough to forgive us and to withhold any kind of harm or punishment that might come on us. Shame is a little different than fear, though. We're going to talk about shame first. There's a lot of ways to understand shame. Maybe you've heard it that that guilt is focused on feeling bad about something that happened, maybe something you did. You feel guilty when you say something that hurts somebody. Shame is a little more about our identity. So I might feel guilty that I was unkind to you, but I might feel ashamed that I'm an unkind person. It's a little deeper than guilt. It's something that is about who I believe I am. Well, the word shame doesn't come up a whole lot in the scripture. There's some stuff about honor and being dishonored, but this word shame isn't something we see in the scripture a whole lot. So I started thinking about, well, what is shame? In the Christian understanding, what is shame? I believe that shame is when we take our fear that the world is too broken for good things to happen and that God doesn't love us. When we take this fear and we direct it at ourselves, I'm not afraid that something outside of me is going to mess up my life. That would be fear. But maybe I'm afraid that I am going to mess things up. Maybe I'm afraid that I'm not the right kind of person to live a good life. There's something wrong with me, something broken inside of me, something about who I am that leads to fear. That would be shame. I'm not afraid that y'all are going to be unkind to me What if I'm afraid that I don't deserve your kindness? Maybe I'm not afraid that you don't love people well, that you're not a loving church. Maybe I believe that. But what happens when I don't believe I deserve that love? That fear of not being worthy of love is shame. Feels a lot like fear, but it's directed in a little bit of a different way. Shame, when it comes to our relationship with God, shame is when we do not believe we're worthy of receiving God's love. 
We may believe God is loving. We may believe that God so loved the world he gave his only son. But if we don't believe God loves me, that's shame. That's shame. And what's hard about that, church, is that it doesn't matter how much someone tells you that they love you. Shame is something inside of us that's arguing against what we're seeing outside of us. It's a fear that's a cycle in our own heart. This is really difficult when it comes to our faith. If we are afraid we don't deserve God's love, that we are unworthy and unable to receive God's love, it really affects the way we live. Well, where did shame come from? In the story of the Bible, shame first enters the scene in Genesis 3, verse 8 through 10. The first humans have just eaten the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. They have decided that from now on, they're gonna choose what's right and wrong for themselves. Before this, they were naked, they were vulnerable, they had nothing to be afraid of. Now that they are choosing for themselves what's right and wrong, look at how they respond to God. Genesis 3, verse eight. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, if you're not ashamed, you don't really need to hide, do you? Who hides? Someone who feels like they have something to hide. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? The man answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid, fear, because I was naked, shame about himself. So I hid. So I hid. This is what shame is. Shame is this sensation, this feeling inside ourselves that we need to hide from God, not because God isn't loving, but because we, there's something wrong with us that says God can't love us. God may be the most amazing God in the world. Jesus may be the most amazing, loving man who ever lived, but can he love me? Well, shame is, like I said, these are ways that we experience death. Shame is a little death, and actually it might be a really large death in our heart and life. It can lead to a ton of anxiety and depression and stress and loneliness. This is how shame kills us. We may be alive, remember, in the garden, they were told that if you eat of the fruit of the tree of choosing for yourself what's right and wrong, you will die. But they didn't die right away. What did they experience? Spiritual internal death, relational death. This internal death, shame kills us in this way. One of the earliest memories I have of shame, like for most of us, is associated with my parents. Now, at the time, as a kid, I don't think I would ever have said that I didn't believe my mother was loving. I thought the world of my mom, I still do. I was convinced and am convinced she loves me. But there was a time when I was in my preteen years that I made a big mistake. And my mom didn't know, but I knew I had to be the one to tell her first. Nowhere in my mind did I believe my mom wasn't loving. Maybe this is how we relate to God. I know God is loving. I've read it a hundred times in the Bible. All my Christian friends talk about it. I know God loves me. I knew my mom loved me, but I doubted whether I was worthy of that love because of the mistake I'd made. This shame so filled me that I was really afraid to go talk to my mom. Was I afraid of my mom? No. I was afraid of how she'd respond to what was wrong with me. And finally, I told her, and she forgave me. She helped me. She walked, she's a wonderful Christian woman. She walked me through what I was going through. And that starts to diffuse the shame a little bit. When we finally are vulnerable, even though we feel naked and we want to hide like Adam and Eve did, we want to hide from others and from God. When we're vulnerable, the shame starts to slip away. But if we don't do that, the shame will slowly kill us. It'll isolate us. It'll put us in a corner alone. It'll be like we're putting ourselves in an emotional timeout for the rest of our lives, and we'll get more lonely and lonely, and our life will get darker and darker, and it will just keep going downhill. 
because we're not convinced we're worthy of love. Here's one of the ways in the church we have shot ourselves in the foot on this. Because we often say things that are really true, and if you go through the scripture, they're so true, but when we say them, they carry a weight that we don't mean for them to carry. So often we talk about this statement that is true, that we don't deserve the grace God gave us. We are not worthy of God's love. This is true, if you've been in church a long time, you're like, yeah, that's true. I'm a sinner, I'm broken, I've made so many mistakes, I've been in this darkness, I've hurt people. Sometimes I've hurt people on purpose. I've not loved with my whole heart, I've not been faithful. I am a dirty sinner, I'm not worthy of love. That's true, we feel that. But our faith is a relationship with God, isn't it? Think about your other relationships. Think of the way that feeling unworthy of someone's love drives you away from them rather than pulling you toward them. This is true in marriage. It may be very true. I've heard, actually, a lot of you have told this to me, that I'm a lucky guy. My, like, when you meet my wife, you're like, you're a lucky guy, man. You're, you're so blessed to have her. I agree. Would I feel closer to Brie if I spent all my time feeling unworthy of her love? Or would distance grow there? Think of your relationship with the church. Many of us, myself included, except now I wear the earpiece, I've gotta be here. But as a Christian, when we've messed up, isn't it easier when we feel unworthy of the love of the church, unworthy to sing praise to God, to avoid the relationship? This is not a rhetorical question. How many of you have avoided reading the Bible because you'd made a mistake recently? At some point in your life, I've, at some point in your life, this is me still to this day. When I make a mistake, it is hard to go read my Bible because I feel like God's mad at me. I feel like he won't forgive me. I feel shame. And we tell ourselves that all the time in the church. You don't deserve love. But I want you to think of it this way. I want you to think of it from this perspective. Maybe we don't deserve God's love. But Jesus died for us. Jesus gave his life for us. Now think about something in your life that maybe isn't very valuable. I think of antiquing. If you ever watch those antique road shows where people will find something and, and someone sells it for like 10 bucks, what little do they know what's worth thousands of dollars? Well, that item is worth what someone's willing to pay for it, isn't it? So maybe if it wasn't for the cross, we wouldn't be worth very much. We wouldn't be worth loving. But guess what was paid for us? Jesus gave his life for us. So are we no longer worth anything? No, why? Because the God of the universe was willing to pay it all for us. So maybe it's true, and the scripture points to this. Without the cross, we aren't worthy of love. But guess what? Jesus went to the cross. Without forgiveness, I may never be worthy of my wife's love. But guess what? We have a practice of forgiving each other. We have a habit of forgiving each other. We have a choice of forgiving each other. When we know that we know that we know the other person loves us, in our bones, when we know this, shame loses its grip. Shame loses its foothold in our lives. Yes, without Jesus, we aren't worthy of love, but guess what? We don't need to talk about that. Once we step into salvation, once we've received Christ, guess what? We've been bought at a high price. We are being resurrected with Jesus. Let's focus on God's statement about us rather than our statement about ourselves. I understand there's, there's plenty of places in the scripture that point to this. Many of us probably came to an altar like this or a moment of salvation because of our understanding that without Jesus we're not worth anything. Our life is meaningless, we're broken. But we aren't without Jesus anymore. Once we're in Christ, we need to remember that God has chosen that we would be worthy of God's love. Not because we deserve it, but it's God's choice. If we can hold on to that, I believe, church, that shame may have a little bit less of a chance to kill us, to tear us apart.
to drive us away from God. We may doubt whether we're worthy of God's love, but when we start to pay attention to what God's paid, what God's done for us, we may start to see ourselves the way God does. What about fear? Shame kills us by making us feel unworthy of love, unworthy of God's love. No matter how much a preacher convinces you God is loving, shame will keep us from feeling it and experiencing it. But how does fear kill us? What is fear? Fear, I believe, is at the root of all sin. Fear is at the root of all ways that we are separate from God. Because fear is what happens when we don't believe that God is truly loving and that God truly has our best interest in mind. If we believe that God is all powerful and all loving and committed to us, we don't need to be afraid of anything, do we? Now our bodies will experience fear, why? We're human. That's a little different, the way our body experiences the, the feeling of fear, the emotion of fear, is different than our spirit experiencing the constant spiritual state of fear. These are different. When, you, when someone cuts you off in traffic and your heart starts pumping, that's not sin, I'm not saying that we're not allowed to be human. But when we start to doubt whether or not God actually is good, when we don't trust God's goodness, that's something to be afraid of. This fear comes from a distrust in God. Here's the problem though. This fear leads us to trust in other things. We end up making a list of things that we believe we need to be okay. Rather than needing what God has said we need, rather than letting God decide what's good for us, which is a relationship with God, a relationship with Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, rather than trusting in that, we come up with this list of other things we think we need. That list might include financial security. That list might include people liking us. That, maybe it's something like we need to have no physical pain. Many of us get very afraid of physical pain. Uncertainty, all these things. We feel like we need to be certain and safe and never vulnerable and in no pain and totally secure because maybe God's not actually on my side. Maybe God isn't working for my, for my good. Maybe I need to take matters into my own hands. If God is not good and God does not love us, we have a lot of reasons to be afraid. This is how fear kills us. Now, I'm not saying every time our body pumps us full of an emotion, it's sin. Jesus was fully human. I'm sure there's times where he felt angry and afraid, and we see him in the garden, weeping and sweating drops of blood. Jesus felt human emotions. But you take them to the Lord. You take them to his Father, and he would pray, and he would give that fear to the Lord, even as his body was still experiencing it. But here's what happens if we don't do that. If we just live in that fear and the stress and the anxiety, we know from pretty solid scientific data that long seasons of fear and anxiety and stress will literally shorten the years we have on this earth. Stress will actually kill us. It affects our body. Living in constant fear of being enough and being okay actually destroys us. It brings actual death to us quicker. Fear can kill us in this way. It can also kill us spiritually. It can make us feel alone and like there's no hope. Remember, this season of resurrection is a season of hope. We believe there's hope enough for us to be free from sin and brokenness. Now we won't be totally free in this life, but we can certainly be more free than we are right now. Fear is not God's best for us. When I think about stories that make me afraid, usually the stories that come to mind are what we would call a leap of faith. Where, like Adam and Eve in the garden, we are vulnerable and we want to hide from God. Maybe God's told us what to do and we don't want to do it because it's scary. 
Maybe we feel like we can't trust God for whatever reason. One of the stories that comes to mind for me in this was when I was at my previous church. I was bivocational, as co-vocational, it means I worked inside and outside the church to kind of tent make and make it so we could pay our bills. And one of the places I worked was at the Chamber of Commerce, and a great organization, I loved my leadership there, but Bree and I were going through an especially hard season. And I'd taken on more work, and I just started school, and Bree was, Bree was going through a lot emotionally, and it was in a lot of pain, and if you know our story, you kind of know some of that. And we just started praying, and I just got the sense even though Bree was in pain and grieving, that the solution was that I would quit my job, my non-church job, and she would go back to work. Now, this doesn't make any sense because her job was maybe not going to pay as much as mine was, and she was the one who was in pain. This was a totally illogical solution to the problem. It didn't make any sense. But we just couldn't get away from the Spirit of God pushing us in this direction. And it was terrifying because I really looked up to my leadership at my job. I really wanted to do right by them. I was afraid, what if I quit this job and we can't make ends meet? And that fear petrified me. Because I wasn't completely convinced that I could trust what God had said. I knew what God had said. I knew that God has told me in the scripture, he'll never leave me nor forsake me. I know that he says that even the sparrows and the flowers of the field, that he cares for all of them, but the idea that he would take care of us, if we take this step of faith, it terrified me. Well, little did we know that when we finally said yes, and I, we made this change, that just two months later we would be in the interview process here, and it actually was exactly what we needed to have that space to prepare to come here. But I gotta tell you, church, at the time, it, was, it wasn't that I didn't know what God was saying. I was struggling to believe that I could trust what I thought God was saying. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you know all the stuff that the Bible has to say about who God is. You know he loves you. You know that God has a plan for you. You know that God doesn't want you to, to be in pain or to, to be hurt or to struggle. You know that God will be there for you you know it up here, but you don't feel it in your heart. That distrust in the love of God leads to this fear that will just drown our life and spiritually kill us. And for many of us, it might physically kill us as well. The good news, the good news is what we find in this passage in First. John chapter 4. The good news is that God is love. God is love, and whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. God doesn't just feel love for us. God is love. So when the Holy Spirit fills us, we are filled with the love of God. When we, are, when we gather for worship, we are covered in the love of God. Even when we are afraid of a situation or a circumstance, even when we feel unworthy of the love of God, love is who God is. It says in verse 18, there is no fear in love. God's not afraid. God's not afraid of our circumstances. God is not afraid of those bills that are piling up. God is not afraid of the things that are coming and the uncertainty. God's not afraid of the issue at your job, the issue with your health, the issue with your relationships. God is not afraid of the things that scare us because God is love and in love there is no fear. So what's the solution to our fear and our shame? It's to be connected to God. Because if God is love and God wants to connect us and fill us with who God is, and that love drives out fear, and that love makes us perfect in love, then connection to God is how we come out of the grave 
of fear and shame. Being close to God. This is intuitive, isn't it? Think of your relationships. Think of a time you've desperately needed forgiveness from someone in your life. What's the thing that actually brings healing to the shame and the fear you're feeling in that moment? It's restored relationship. It's that hug even though you were worried maybe they'll never hug me again. It's that I forgive you even though you were worried this was the final straw that they would never love you and forgive you again. It's that peace that comes from knowing they still choose to love you and to be in relationship with you even though you feel unworthy, even though you're not sure you can trust it. The thing that helps us trust in the love of God is nearness to God. This is simple but difficult. This is really simple but really difficult because when we feel ashamed and afraid, what do we want to do? We want to run away from God, don't we? We want to avoid the things that remind us of God because we're worried he won't forgive us. There's something wrong with us that's unforgivable or maybe God's love's not quite big enough for that. But God doesn't have love. God is love and God is infinite. God can't run out. God cannot run out of love for us. God doesn't have parts of God's self that are loving and some that aren't loving. You know, if you're kind of a mess, he'll give you the part that's not so loving until you get your act together. God is constantly pouring out the Holy Spirit on us if we're willing to receive it, free of charge by the grace of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. And there's no part of God that is afraid God's not afraid of your mess. I had a pastor in my life who used to say it this way. When something happens, God's not up there in heaven, wringing his hands, wondering what to do. God's not afraid. God's not afraid of your brokenness. God's not afraid of the parts of you you feel are unlovable. God's not gonna start peeling away the layers of who you are and suddenly be surprised and disgusted. God has nothing for you but love when we are in Christ. And we are allowed, we are invited, we are privileged to be in Christ, each and every one of us. No exceptions, full stop, we're invited into the love of God. This is one of those things that's simple and you've probably heard it before. If you've been in church even twice, you've heard about the love of God, I would imagine. This isn't new. And yet, isn't it so hard to believe it about ourselves? Am I the only one who knows in my head that God is love, but doesn't always feel in my chest that God loves me? I I can't be the only one. I can't be the only one who experiences the death of fear and shame still because the enemy's doing anything that he can to get a foothold in our heart and in our life. This is a truth that we can't take for granted. We must keep coming back to this truth. That when we feel naked and ashamed and we wanna hide, guess who comes looking for us? Adam didn't have to go look for God in the garden. Guess who comes looking for us when we have good reason to feel ashamed? Guess who went to the cross while we were still sinners? God didn't wait for us to clean up our act. Guess what? The world was messy when Jesus came as a baby. It was messy when Jesus died on the cross. It was messy when Jesus was resurrected from the grave. The mess does not surprise God. Not even a little bit. You may think that that next layer is the thing that's finally gonna be the end of God's love for you. I'm here to tell you that's not true. There is nothing God could ever open up in your life and your heart that will surprise God. God knows everything. He died for you knowing everything. He loves you knowing everything. This is what's hard about giving up shame and fear in our relationships, isn't it? There's nobody who knows all of our mess. Your friends might discover a broken part of you that they didn't know about. 
not with God, (laughs) even the broken parts of us that we don't know yet, the sin we're still discovering in our lives. God knows. Here's a beautiful truth. Perfect love drives out fear. And remember what I said earlier. Fear is at the center of sin. This idea that I can't trust God, so I'm gonna trust something else. I'm gonna trust this way to numb my pain. I'm gonna trust this way to control what's going on in the situation. I'm gonna get angry, and I'm gonna bully everybody. I'm gonna trust this way of making sure I'm okay. I'm gonna go and try to solve this myself. When we don't trust God, we get ourselves in trouble, don't we? That's where sin comes from. Because we're afraid we can't trust God. But perfect love drives out fear. Do you see the the God math going on here? If perfect love drives out fear, and fear is the root of all of our sin and brokenness, guess what? Perfect love brings resurrection power to our sin and our brokenness. Doesn't matter what flavor of sin and brokenness you've got in your life. You may say, well, pastor, that works for people that are just, you know, depressed, but I'm bitter. Does the love of God help with bitterness? Yeah. Yeah, it does. We're going to talk about that next week. We'll talk about anger and bitterness next Sunday. Does God's love make up for the ways I've hurt people? Yes, it does. Does God's love make up for the ways that I've been addicted or, or I've struggled with these areas where I've hurt other people? Yeah, it does. Does God's love make up for the way that I'm selfish? Yes, it does. Because God is love and love drives out fear and God's chosen to be in a relationship with you. That's God's choice. And we have a choice to respond. We have a choice to respond to this. That is where hope comes from. This hope, we're trying to grow our hope this month. The thing that grows our hope is this. Hope is when we know we're loved by God and we know that God is loving and good And therefore, we can place our trust in God. That's where hope comes from. I don't know which part of that equation you're missing today. Maybe you've been raised in the church or you've been been coming to church for a while and you know that you know that you know that God is loving. But it is just, it feels like an impossible mountain to climb to believe God loves you. I pray about that together today. Maybe you are pretty self-confident. You feel like you're a pretty solid person. But it's hard to believe that God actually is on the move for his glory and your good. Maybe you don't struggle with feeling self-worth. Maybe you struggle with trusting that God actually cares about the world. As a perfectionist, I go through this. I often feel that God doesn't care enough to make everything perfect or that if I mess up, then God's will won't happen. That's distrusting the love and the goodness of God. We may feel like God doesn't love me enough to be just, so I need to be angry so that God, so that the world will turn out good. I can't trust God to deal with the problems. Maybe you don't lack self-confidence and self-love, but you struggle to believe God loves you and God is good. We're gonna pray about that. In the next few weeks, we're gonna dive into more parts of this, but I, I just gotta tell you, I just gotta tell you as your pastor, if you have felt like you're on the edge of growing and being transformed for a long time, like you're so close to being made new, I've, God, I've been so close to being loving and kind and less angry. I'm so close to being at peace and having hope. Being close to God and having hope is the way. We will never be transformed more than we hope is possible. Our relationships will never be more healed than we hope is possible. We will never be more free from sin than we believe is possible. And guess what? We're a holiness people. We believe God is on the move trying to do that in our lives. So I'm gonna invite you again this week to put on hope for another seven days until next Sunday. Put back on hope and God will be with you, and God will grow these things in our lives. 
We're gonna go to the Lord in prayer this morning. I wanna invite you to take whatever posture you need. If you need to kneel at your seat or at the altar, if you need to bow your head, maybe you need to stand. Maybe there's one part of your life, I'm gonna invite us all to close our eyes and bow our heads, take whatever posture we need now. Maybe there's a part of your life that you've struggled to trust God with. Maybe there's something in particular that just fills you with shame or fear and you, you wanna say, you know what? Just this morning, for a moment, I've got enough hope to give it to God. I want you to tell that to God right now. What is that thing? That area that your hope hadn't been big enough, but your hope's just big enough, just for right now, just for a moment, your hope's big enough to give it to the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. We confess that we are not always loving. We're not always hopeful. We're so often, we're afraid and we're ashamed and, and we struggle to believe the things we claim to believe about you. We struggle to feel your love. God, we give that to you today. In this moment, Lord, the, the things we've named in our hearts the things we've told you in that secret place, we ask you to begin transforming in a fresh way today. Lord, we know you're not surprised by any of this. There is nothing we could ever bring to you in prayer that would surprise you or change the way you feel about us. So God, would you seal in our hearts today the word that you've spoken and the vulnerability we've shared. Remind us we don't have to hide. Remind us that you are loving and that you want to be with us. God, for those of us who felt shame, either for a season or maybe for our whole life, we felt unworthy of love. Would you remind us this morning in a way that changes the trajectory of the rest of our life that you are not ashamed of us, that you've chosen to love us You've chosen to pay the price to make us lovable. That you choose us as a church and personally, you choose us, Lord. Push back the shame with your love, Lord, we pray. God, for those of us who are afraid, and you know, if we're honest, we've got good reason to be. We have issues, we have challenges, there's things in our lives, Lord, we have what we feel like are good reasons to be afraid. Lord, would you capture us with an even bigger reason to have hope? Lord, we thank you that as we sang, great is thy faithfulness, as we sang, it is well. Lord, that we don't have to have a life that's free from pain to have a life that's free from fear. Thank you that you love us and you're with us even in the uncertainty. God, we give you those uncertainties today. Whatever it is in our own heart and life, we give you our fear. And Lord, we ask. We ask that the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that rolled the stone away, that allowed Jesus Christ to walk out of that grave would help us to walk out of the graves of fear and shame this week. Fill us with your presence. Resurrect us again. Revive our hearts again, God, we pray. Together, as your church, as your children, as those you love, we pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Church, if, if you prayed for the first time today, one of those prayers, opening yourself up in a fresh way, or maybe for the first time in a way to God's love for you, tell somebody. Tell the person next to you, find one of our pastors, find a greeter, find anybody. Tell somebody, I'd love to hear from you so I can pray for you about that in a specific way. What I would invite all of us to our feet if we're able to stand Here's what's exciting about gathering for worship on Sunday. We're gathered to be filled with this good news, and then guess what? We're sent back into God's world to share this. 
If we receive God's love, we can love other people well, and we are sent in that hope. Would you receive this blessing? May you know the God who is fully love. May you know God's perfect love that casts out fear. May you know that God loves you no matter what. There is nothing in your life that can change how much God loves you. And as you go this week, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Church, it's in that hope you're sent back into God's good world. Hug somebody. Tell them you love them. We'll see you next week.